We are among 68% of our world population who have access to basic sanitation. What that means is that we can, can actually defecate in an improved latrine or toilet where we don't have to touch our own feces. Okay. That's not true for many people on our planet. One in three of us on our planet do not have access to this basic sanitation. That's 33 of us in this room now, going home this afternoon, and having our toilets taken away. Would we stand for that? Okay. What about the poorest people in our world? For nearly 900 million people, open defecation is still a fact of life. That means that when they go to the toilet, they don't go to the toilet. They have to poo in the open, in storm drains, in the bushes, in the fields, or in open water sources. This is a really stark and sad reality for lots of people on our planet. We're very lucky. What we can do is, when we go home, <coughs> when we need water, we can turn on our tap. But 2.1 billion people lack safe water. What that means is water that is free from contamination. Add to that, Another 10% of our world's population eating food that has been irrigated by wastewater. What do I mean by wastewater? Well, what we're talking about here is any water that has been contaminated or has its quality decreased by human activity. That includes excrement, that includes urine and feces in the water. When we want to get rid of our excrement, what do we do? We flush our loos. But for many people, that's obviously not an option. And living close to, in close proximity to human feces means that many people are dying unnecessarily from what are largely preventable diseases. It's our under fives. It's our school children. It's our pregnant women who are most at risk here. Would we want that for our families? No. That includes a number of different diseases and parasitic worms that I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. We wouldn't want that for our families, but many of these people are living in developing countries. And so why are parasites such a problem? Well, they're a problem because that's where we see the most limited access to safe water and adequate sanitation. I don't mean sanitation that we're used to, I mean adequate sanitation. In Sub-Saharan Africa, we're seeing an increase in people needing to use open defecation because of population growth. If you think about these people living in many developing countries, just their daily activities put them at risk of disease. They need to go and collect water. That water may well be contaminated. They might be fishing in contaminated water. They might be collecting water for animals, to look after animals, or to look after their family. So their daily activities increase their risk of parasitism. For many people, they don't have access to the education that we can enjoy. There are many millions of children that are out of school, school-age children that are out of school because they have to provide for their families. They miss out on education to help limit the spread of these diseases, but also they miss out on some of the prevention programs that are taking place in schools. Add to that the lack of sustainable health care, and we can see that we're starting to have a major issue here. But imagine, if you will, that you're at risk of these parasitic diseases just because of where you live just because of the climate that you're in, which can actually harness and transmit and increase the likelihood of transmission of parasites. <coughs> Underpinning all of this, we have poverty, we have malnutrition, malnutrition, and as we've just heard, conflict and unrest. They add to all of these problems. Children who are living in areas of conflict and civil unrest are four times less likely to have access to basic water what I mean by basic water is that they can collect water within 30 minutes from a protected water source. That's not what we enjoy. That's not what we're used to. These children who are living in conflict are also twice as likely to have no access to basic sanitation. Okay, so what that does is it puts them at risk from major, a number of major parasitic diseases. So there are one and a half billion people on our planet are infected by what we call soil-transmitted helminths. Helminths that are transmitted because people come into contact with infective eggs or infective larvae. There's a number of different important species that are 
um, evolved here, but three of the most important include things like the roundworms, which is Ascaris lumbricoides. I've brought one along for you to have a look at today. I've left a few others outside for you to have a look at as well over time because some of them are quite small. This is quite a big beastie, grows up to about 35 to 45 centimetres, but most of our parasites are quite small. So here on the screen we've got the human whipworm, Trichurus trichuria. I've got a sheep species outside for you to have a look at, and also the hookworms, Ankylostoma duodenali and Nicatra americanus. They are three of the most important uh, parasites that cause problems on our planet. But they do exactly what they say on the tin. They are spread by contact with either infective eggs or by contact with infective larvae. If we think about how that can happen, it can happen in a lot of different ways. You can end up picking up these infections when you're eating or handling unwashed vegetables, particularly if they have been um, fertilised by faeces from human, that makes human fertiliser. And that's very common. You can pick these up from ingesting contaminated water, again a major problem. But we also see massive issues with contamination from the soil. This is where children, for example, will go out and they will play in the soil and they will pick up these parasite eggs and then accidentally ingest them when they eat or uh, when they put their hands near their mouths or in their mouths. So that's a major route of infestation. We also see occupational exposure. So people like miners and tea pickers, particularly at risk from these parasitic diseases. Most of us wouldn't touch poo, would we? No, we'd stay away from it. But there's a delay in the life cycle, which I'll talk about in just a second, which means that you don't actually know that you're handling or touching <coughs> fecally contaminated soil or fecally contaminated material. Hookworm larvae down at the bottom here, so this is, uh, these are three of the most important parasite eggs that we can see. Up the top is Ascaris lumbricoides, this is Trichurus trichuria here, and this one down at the bottom is Nicator americanus, it's a hookworm um, egg. They're a little bit different. You don't actually ingest the eggs, that's not how the infection works. The infection works when the eggs make contact with the soil, they'll hatch, and then the larvae will develop. And quite often, you will then get those larvae penetrating the skin, particularly when you're walking barefoot. If we look at that life cycle, what we'll see is typically what's happening is the eggs will come out in the faeces of the individual, they'll be infective about 18 days later. So it's not fresh faeces that's the problem here. It's when that faecal material starts to break down. You won't know it's there, but the parasites, the eggs, will be developing. We'll then ingest those eggs, and eventually, depending on the species, they'll go through a bit of an interesting journey around the body. They will end up in the intestine. That whole cycle starts again. Hookworms, a little bit different. The eggs will make contact with the soil. They'll hatch in about one to two days. The larvae will then develop, and about five to ten days later, they will start to um, penetrate, be able to penetrate host skin or human skin. So that's some examples of parasites that are really important. But another example that I wanted to show you today is the second most important tropical disease after malaria. This is schistosomiasis. Schistosomiasis is a disease that's caused by a helminth, another worm, but this time the worm's not living in the intestine. The worm at the top here, these two images here, that's a male worm, the big fat one, and the one all curled up, that's a female worm. If you want to have a look at those, I've got some under the microscope for you to look at. They're actually living in the bloodstream. Okay, so these are living in a different place entirely. But the transmission route is the same. It's through contact with infected water. So what happens is when people are infected with these worms, they will produce eggs either in their feces or in their urine. There are two main forms of schistosomiasis. One is an intestinal form, the other one is one around the urogenital tract. When they defecate or urinate in water, those eggs make contact with that water and they'll hatch. They'll hatch into a little larval stage called a myricidium, and that will infect a snail intermediate host. From that snail intermediate host, the parasite will undergo a lot of development. It will then shed these little things that look a bit like sperm over there on the far corner. They're called saccharii, that's the infective stage of the parasite. And when a human goes into infected water, these little things will burrow into the skin. They will then shed their tail and they'll go on a lovely migratory journey around the body and eventually end up in the right sort of blood vessels for the species of parasite. We've got about five different species that infect humans, but the most important, the ones that we see most frequently, are Schistosoma mansoni and Schistosoma uh, japonicum, that are the intestinal forms, and Schistosoma hematobium, which is the urinary form. 
So what can we do? What should we be doing? A whole range of things, I hope. First thing, the core principle, the core thing that underpins preventing or limiting the spread of these diseases is education. But as we've already seen, we've got so many children out of education for other reasons. Provision of safe water and sanitation. This is goal number six on the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN. This is really, really important. They want to try and reach universal access by 2030. But we actually missed the 2015 Millennium Goals that would have allowed us to have access to clean, good sanitation for 77% of the population. We're currently at 68%. So we're going to have to work really hard to get to those goals. Should we be addressing lifestyles? In the West, we talk about lifestyle choice, don't we? This is not a choice for these people who are living in these environments. But by addressing our attitudes, we can help. Do we want to tackle poverty? That's number one on the sustainable development goals. That's going to be a big game changer. But we've got 767 million people still below the international poverty line of an income of $1.90 per day. Many of these people are in extreme poverty, and these are the people that we need to deal with. Do we need more research? Almost certainly yes. But all of these things are going to cost money. Where's that going to come from? We need to think about that. So what we need to do is take an integrated approach. But what I would say to you is these inequalities are often invisible to us. 800 children dying every day from preventable diseases caused by lack of good quality water and poor sanitation. As horrible as this analogy sounds, that's the equivalent of two jumbo jets full of these under fives crashing every day. If we saw that, would we take action? So lots of things that can happen. There are mass deworming campaigns that are taking place. And the, in the end of September, the World Health Organization published some new recommendations based on some of the successes that had happened last year, where 68% of those children most at risk were being treated. The goal then is to reach 75% of those children in a couple of years' time. They're really important goals, and these are things that are happening. But it makes it a little bit difficult to think how we can help here. Other things that we can do is if we improve sanitation and we improve water sources, not only do we reduce the spread of soil-transmitted helminths and schistosomiasis, it brings other tangible benefits as well. It promotes dignity, but also safety. Open defecation for women, particularly and young girls, is particularly dangerous. It promotes school attendance. Again, if there's somewhere safe where you can go and use the, the toilet, where you can defecate safely, or where you know you've got access to clean water, you're more likely to be able to then go to school. That promotes school attendance. Again, particularly important for women and <coughs> young girls. That brings other benefits, doesn't it? It opens up new opportunities, and it also gives you more choices. If you're able to get a better education, your opportunities change. If we reduce the number of parasites that are living with these, in these people, these parasites are feeding on host tissues, they're causing malnutrition, they are causing malaise, they are causing a whole range of particular chronic problems that means that these people are not able to work or achieve the lifestyles that they want. By reducing the parasites, we reduce mal malnutrition. But interestingly, we can also use properly, safely managed faeces as a renewable source of energy. We can use that for cooking and we can use it for lighting. We can also recover valuable nutrients and water from properly managed faeces. And that can be used for other purposes like agriculture. So what else could we do? I don't know what you think. Is this not our problem? I think it's very much our problem. And if I can do one thing, what I'd like to do is ask you to find out more information and perhaps think about getting involved. I'm not here to advocate any particular organisation. My job is to perhaps ask you if you wouldn't mind, if you've got the capacity and if you've got the technology, to do a very simple web search for water, sanitation and health, or the acronym WASH. You'll find out lots of stuff that's going on around the world, lots of really important information. And 
you will also be doing your bit to help open, end open defecation. I think that if you value your right to poo on a loo, this is something that we can do here. So we can end open defecation and we can promote universal access to basic sanitation and water by 2030. We've talked a lot already about inequality. And I just want to end on a personal story, a story that you might find a little bit odd. But parasites don't care who you are, what you do. You just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that parasite, all it needs is a host. All it wants to do is survive. It doesn't care whether you've got money. It doesn't care whether you're poor. But if you're poor, you're more likely to get infected. As travel and tourism opens up, we travel further afield, don't we? Do various different things. And I did this on my honeymoon. I spent my honeymoon not just with my new husband, but with some other new friends as well. <laughs> and when I was on honeymoon, here I was, taking a little walk along the beach at night. My new husband and I were nicknamed the most active honeymoon couple. Not for the reasons that you might be thinking, but simply for the fact that we were doing lots of water sports. We were out in the water every day, either swimming, snorkeling, diving, messing about either on or in the water. That meant that I spent most of that time barefoot. What happened to me was I took a little trundle along, around on the beach, and I couldn't see any faeces. I couldn't see anything that looked like I shouldn't step in it. But what happened was I ended up with little hookworm larvae that managed to burrow into my toe. Now, because it takes a while for these things to happen, it wasn't until I got home that my foot started to get a bit itchy. It was burning a bit, it was feeling a bit uncomfortable. And I thought, hmm, I picked up athlete's foot. So I got my antifungal cream and I slapped it on and a few days later, nothing was happening. And then, after a couple more days, I started to see little telltale tracks on my foot. And I thought, aha, uh -huh, I know what you are. This was a cutaneous larval migrans. And so literally, I don't know if we can really see it here, I had hookworm larvae migrating in my foot. They didn't get very far, because actually they were hookworms that belonged to a cat. They wanted to actually be in a cat gut and not in my gut. They weren't human hookworms. And so they got stuck in my foot, but it was quite painful. So I literally hot-footed it down to the GP surgery, who was absolutely delighted because it was the first time she'd ever seen this in the flesh. <laughs> we don't often see this in the UK. And so I then was able to get treated with ivermectin. Those of you who maybe come from an agricultural background will know that we don't usually use that for human use in the UK. We use it for animals, for treating worms in animals. But I had ivermectin. It solved the problem really easily for me. I didn't have to go back into that contaminated environment. I got treatment. I was okay. The point is, parasites affect us all, and we all have a duty to do something about it. And we can help that by promoting water, sanitation, and health. Thank you.